everybody. Welcome to the What Is Money Show. I am thrilled to have you here joining me on my mission to help shine light on the corruption of money. Now, a little bit about this show and how it makes money. We are 100% sponsor based, which means that all the revenues we derive come from sponsorships. But I try to be very selective about the sponsors that I work with, specifically trying to choose those who have values well aligned to the values expressed on this show, like freedom, education, self-sovereignty, etc. So what I'm going to do is a few ad reads right here at the top of the show and then a few ad, ad reads in the middle. And I hope you won't skip them. I hope you'll take the time, listen and see what they have to offer, because again, these are hand selected sponsors. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, Ledin. Ledin lets you do more with your digital assets. For instance, Ledin offers a B2X loan product that lets you leverage your existing Bitcoin to buy even more Bitcoin. Or you can also get traditional Bitcoin collateralized US dollar loans through Ledin as well. Ledin also offers both Bitcoin and USDC denominated savings accounts, letting you generate yield on your digital assets. Recently, Ledin has launched a Bitcoin mortgage product as well that lets you use Bitcoin to buy a home or finance one that you already own. So go to Ledin.io, that's L-E-D-N.io today to sign up. Alex Gladstein, welcome back to the What Is Money Show. Happy to be here. Thanks for uh, giving me the platform to talk about my latest work, Robert. Of course, man. Yeah, so... Your latest, well, I guess first, by way of quick introduction, you are the chief strategy officer for the Human Rights Foundation, and you are the author of a book titled Check Your Financial Privilege. And you've got a re recent article. Uh, you published this in Bitcoin Magazine. I'm not sure if you published it elsewhere, mm -hmm. um, titled Structural Adjustment, How the IMF and World Bank Repress Poor Countries and Funnel Their Resources to Rich Ones. Um, and that's the piece we're going to be talking about today. Um, and I think you said you plan on converting this into a book and sometime in quarter two, 23. Yeah, there will be a book coming out, um, in Q2, 2023, uh, with the title, uh, hidden repression. Um, and there'll be a subtitle and a forward uh, by a friend and excited to publish that with Bitcoin magazine. So the followers, uh, today they can read the article at Bitcoin magazine. They can listen to it. Uh, guy Swan very generously, uh, already made it an audio book. So you can listen to that on Bitcoin audible, and then they can look out for the book, uh, probably coming out around April. Awesome. Uh, well, I'm excited to talk to you about this today. It just, You've done a great job detailing some of the consequences of corrupt money um, and some of these structural outcomes that have emerged over time as a result of a fiat standard. Mm -hmm. uh, is there anything you want to say? I, I know we were talking a little bit offline about the big themes here. Mm -hmm. uh, is there perhaps something you could speak to about the big themes in this piece before we dive in? Yeah, well, I think I was drawn to this topic originally because of my background as a human rights advocate. I, I think that most Bitcoiners know that there's something fishy going on with the IMF and to, uh, you know, a separate extent, the World Bank. I I don't think many of them know exactly what these institutions do, why they were founded, uh, how they operate. I, I didn't know a, like a huge amount about that either before I started this research about six months ago. Um, and what I found was like way worse than I could have possibly uh, imagined. And again, my initial intrigue or interest was that I work with people who live under dictatorships. That, that's kind of what I do at the Human Rights Foundation is we we try to help um, civil civil rights groups and uh, human rights groups that operate under difficult political conditions. And I just started to notice um, that over the decades, you know, the IMF and the World Bank had always supported dictators. I was really interested in exploring that. And that was my entry point. And then that just kind of opened up a huge narrative that I started to piece together uh, that describes in the article and the essay, you know, exactly how these institutions function and, and kind of what they do. And if I were just to summarize it in a line or a sentence, it's that the IMF and World Bank uh, help 
subsidize the way of life for people in wealthy countries uh, by depressing uh, or deflating uh, the standards of living for people in poor countries. Mm. Wow. Yeah. Kind of a flies in the face of what most people's conception of these quote unquote development banks or development funds are for. Um, Mm -hmm. and as is the case with many government projects, it seems like it's the opposite of what it says it is, right? It's not development at all. It's creating capital flows from poor countries to rich countries. Yeah. They have this giant poster often emblazoned on their headquarters in Washington, the IMF and World Bank share, uh, headquarters. They are connected by different tunnels and bridges, uh, to, to almost stress the fact that they're essentially sister organizations. And it's, it's this giant, giant thing that says end poverty. Mm. And that's really kind of grotesque in a way when you realize that what they really do is they engineer the economies of poor countries to be dependent on agriculture and goods from rich countries. Mm. Um, and over time to basically steal their agency and make them dependent on us for what they need to survive. Uh, and also kind of stuck in like this debt trap that just keeps growing and growing and growing and growing. Um, and it, it's true to say that the last, you know, 50 years of this is I, in my opinion, a creature of the fiat system, the fiat standard, the post 71 political economy. But what I thought was really interesting is that these were dynamics that existed during traditional colonialism, right. That existed mm-hmm. obviously under the gold standard. The thing is like during the gold standard, like you just had straight up violence, like, right. You had like <laughs> countries with a lot of guns and soldiers going to poor, poor countries with less technology and pillaging them and looting them. And, um, you know, that really continued up through, uh, the beginning of the, the 20th century. A- and then you had this big wave of like decolonialization. Right. Um, and that in the 1920s, thirties, forties, fifties, you know, it, it, it really ended by about the year 1960s, kind of known as the formal end of colonialism, right? All the European imperial powers were like uh, forced to pull away from their, emp- their former empires. And what I think is just really interesting is that the World Bank and IMF kind of become um, this tool for Western powers. What I really mean by that is the G5, right? So let's say England, um, Germany, France, the, the the U S and, and Japan to exploit poorer countries, you know, what was usually, what was previously done with violence, with weapons, uh, it, it has since, since the sixties, um, and, and especially since 71 been done through debt, debt is the new weapon wow. that is deployed to subjugate uh, these countries, um, and to solve an old, old problem, which is the problem of inflation. Like essentially what you had during traditional colonialism was Western societies always having this issue of inflation and being able to help ameliorate that they would, they would get these like super cheap uh, inputs of like cheap labor and goods from like peripheral uh, countries or peripheral zones. So you, you have this kind of core periphery construct, which is popular in Marxist thought, but I think it's actually quite apt. You have like the core countries, the core economic powers back then. And in order to like keep their living standards good and to fight off inflation, they would require this like external input of like super cheap labor and goods. And that was accomplished by colonialism um, for a very long time by like, you know, military imperialism, let's say. And then you had this transition period, which was marked by two world wars, the great depression, et cetera between the twenties and the, and, and the fifties essentially. Um, and during that time, uh, the, the, the way that the cheap input would come into the core, uh, changed from being kind of enforced by violence to being enforced by debt. Mm. And that is something that I, I just hit me really like a, it hit me like a ton of bricks when I started to realize that. And I don't think that bureaucrats at the IMF or World Bank sat down, whether it was in 1944 in Bretton Woods when they created these institutions, or maybe in the 60s. I don't think that they sat down and just decided this. Like, I don't think there was like a grand conspiracy. I think this was sort of just an outcome of how the world was being shaped. But I do think that by the 70s, they they were, they, you know, people understood what was happening. Mm. 
And I think to this day, the, the very top officials at these institutions are aware of this. Um, there's been some reforms in the last 20 years, but generally speaking, these institutions continue to do uh, the work of basically opening up these peripheral economies and taking goods and labor uh, to support and sustain the lifestyle of people in the West. Again, what was once done with violence is now done with debt. Well, it reminds me of the, I think it was a John, John Adams quote that there's two ways to conquer a country. One is by sword. The other is by debt. hundred percent. And so what it, would you call this soft or monetary colonialism then? And that we shifted from a hard violence-based colonialism to something softer or more monetary? Yeah, no, I think that's exactly right. I think that the world, you know, through social revolutions and just the general, pro I guess you call it progress, mm -hmm. traditional colonialism essentially became like inappropriate or like, right. you know, <laughs> like not right. acceptable. Politically um, incorrect. <laughs> yeah. Like when the U S invaded Iraq or when Russia invaded Ukraine earlier this year, th these are considered like unacceptable, um, actions. Uh, and they, they happen a lot less frequently than they used to like brazen, just like thefts of land or like colonial actions are considered uh, inappropriate. I mean, they used to be the way of the world, right? So as that ability to just go and like rape and pillage became less uh, possible for, for, for the powers that be, they developed a new way to do that. And, and I, I, yeah, I agree completely. I, I think what you saw is a transformation of traditional military imperialism to uh, monetary imperialism. Um, and again, this, this, this transformation really crystallizes in the sixties. Um, when the world bank and IMF were created in 44, they were not created for this purpose necessarily. They, they were, I do believe created authentically to essentially help rebuild Europe and to stabilize a world economy that was in disarray. Mm -hmm. Um, and if you want to be sort of, let's say, um, uh, generous to, to the Bretton Woods, uh, architects, um, you know, Europe and Japan were destroyed. The world bank is a development bank. It, it, what it does is it makes loans, um, for infrastructure projects that, that, you know, would, uh, not be, uh, appetizing for private capital. That's kind of the idea. Mm -hmm. So basically in the late forties and fifties, the world bank was like very much focused on Europe, Japan, and, and kind of the big allies. Um, and the IMF was, was created as a, basically a, a lender of last resort for the world economy. So what, what, what countries would do, um, is you, you have to become a member of the IMF and you have to deposit a certain amount of currency into the IMF to, to, to join. And then only then can you, uh, become a member of the world bank. So membership of the IMF is required before you become a member of the world bank. So the idea is, you, you know, all these countries and there's what 170 plus countries that are members of both these days, uh, um, including China, which as we'll get into later is, has got its own sort of version of this. Um, but essentially in the beginning they would have, they would put in a mixture of their own fiat plus gold because <laughs> basically gold was, you know, considered the best currency. So, in a in a really interesting note, like in the forties and fifties, all these countries that joined the IMF were were joined were doing so by like putting up some sort of amount of gold, and the IMF still has like some crazy amount of gold. Um, in fact, the total amount is uh, two thousand eight hundred fourteen metric tons. Um, yeah, and and members were originally forced to pay twenty five percent of their deposit at the IMF in gold, hmm. um, and this was this was normal until the seventies, basically. So the IMF still has this enormous amount of gold, ironically. Uh, it's sort of the sort of perfect do as I say, not as I do, you know, no, no IMF member state can have a gold standard or, or you know, but, but <laughs> the IMF has all this gold. Right. Um, but anyway, all these countries were forced to, or no, they, they chose to, or were forced to, et cetera, uh, join the IMF in order to usually in order to get access to the world bank. So they would deposit some mix of their fiat currency or dollars and, and then gold, and then what would happen is if they encountered a balance of payment crisis. So if at some point later, uh, their imports became much higher than their exports for a sustained period, um, then they could go back to the IMF and draw down, uh, you know, essentially a credit line. 
And the more they drew, the more expensive the terms were. Mm-hmm. And the, this was like, this was like basically, uh, uh, allocated in tranches, um, of different interest rates. Um, but essentially it was supposed to be like a bailout fund. And the idea was that like the people who built Bretton Woods didn't want to see what happened in the thirties happen. They didn't want to see like, uh, countries do like competitive devaluations. They didn't want to see like worldwide depression and a closure of international trade. They really wanted international trade to flow. Now, obviously that's self-interested. The U S you know, was benefiting from that. And so were the European countries. Um, but that's kind of why the IMF exists is to keep international trade flowing no matter what. And, and we'll revisit that, but that's like important to remember. Um, but I do, but I do think that at the beginning, these countries, rather these institutions, did serve these purposes. They did fund a lot of infrastructure in war-torn countries, and and they did help like countries in crisis uh, with with short-term loans. Um, but what ends up happening is like by the '60s, uh, the European countries, Japan, the U.S., I mean, are all like doing much better. They're all kind of like let's say back on their feet in many regards. And these institutions, like some people called for their um, abolition, for their retirement. Like, why do we need them anymore? But instead, what they did is they basically shifted their focus to what was called the third world or what we would call the global south or the developing Mm -hmm. countries, the poor countries of the world. Um, And this would be Latin America, uh, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, the Middle East, uh, Central Asia, South Asia, Southeast Asia, parts of Eastern Europe. And this is where the IMF and World Bank really focused on between, let's say, 1960 and 2010, for, for the most part. This this was their bread and butter, was extending credit at different interest rates to this part of the world. The IMF's credit uh, was, was essentially... Um, uh, it was not for particular projects. When the IMF gives money to bail out a country in crisis, it's 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 for a, it's for a general fund. Like the the government can spend it as it sees fit. Essentially, mm. um, when the World Bank gives out money traditionally, uh, at least before the eighties, it, it it was for a particular sector or a project. So it would be like for the petroleum sector or for the cotton sector or be for a very particular project like a dam. Mm. So this is kind of how the two institutions were different. Um, now it's not no strings attached money though. This is very important to, 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 to remember when we talk about what the bank and the fund do, we have to remember, and we always forget people forget in development economics, but when, when credit is extended to a borrower, the borrower is going to have to pay back principal plus interest. People always forget this. So this, this enormous amount of money that was deployed to poorer countries by richer countries, you know, for 75 years was, was considered an act of charity. And you know, that that's kind of how you kind of think about it in your mind. You're like, Oh, the world bank and I'm after like, you know, humanitarian in some way. Hmm. Um, they're making money off of these loans. This is not a, this is not a nonprofit enterprise here. Uh Um, and they're making money off the global Cantillon effect. So they can borrow cheaply dollars from private banks in the U S at, let's say in the seventies, let's say maybe it was 5%. And then they would loan it out to poor countries at 8% and they would take the spread. Mm. So this is kind of how these institutions were operating. They were lending for different purposes, making money off that. And often, you know, given the high interest rates throughout that period, uh, especially in the seventies and eighties, and, um, and given the length of some of these loans, like IMF loans were supposed to be short term, two, three, four years. But they kept. They would often go through something called the Paris Club, which was a place where poor countries would go to like ask for an extension. So some of these IMF loans were were really extended, and World Bank loans were like 10, 20, 30 year, sometimes forty year loans. Okay. Mm. Um, so when all was said and done, you might have had a country borrow a billion dollars and have to pay back a billion and a half in the end after all the interest. So it's important to note that like these are not no strings attached gifts; these are loans where the borrower is going to have to pay back more and sometimes a lot more than what they borrowed in the first place, number one. And number two, for the IMF since inception and for the World Bank since, I don't know, the 80s, um, there was also something called structural adjustment, which is what I titled the essay. And and structural adjustment is a euphemism for describing a bunch of austerity conditions that were would, would, would be attached to the loan. So the loan would be like dispersed over, a, let's say, a year or two. Um, according to the local government passing a bunch of milestones that were drawn up by the kind of economic doctors who worked at the IMF and World Bank, they would be things like 
um, currency devaluation, uh, increased taxes, uh, raising interest rates, mm. um, uh, scrapping any sort of subsidy for kind of uh, basic food or energy, um, putting a ceiling on uh, wages, um, special rules for multinational companies, um, shrinking the domestic bank credit in the country. Mm. So what we're talking about here are like policies designed to cause a recession or a depression um, at the at the sort of at the at the favor of exports. So what structural adjustment policies tried to do was basically they were looking at these countries like a private equity firm might look at a company when it tries to engineer a takeover or whatever. Mm -hmm. Like they're looking at how can we like increase profits and reduce expenses. So. They're talking about, um, you know, without any care or thought or empathy for the people who live in that country, um, how do we, as soon as possible, as fast as possible, reduce expenditures and and, and increase profits? So that's kind of like the heartless strategy at, at work here. And, um, you know, you don't have to go back, you know, Bitcoiners probably don't have to go past the first one, the currency devaluation to see how kind of rotten this thing is. Yeah. Um, we think about the IMF imposed currency devaluation that some are familiar with that happened in West and Central Africa in 1994 um, in the colonial Frank zone, where a hundred and some odd million people lost half their money overnight uh, due to an IMF imposed decision that was in coordination with the French government where they just decided that these countries weren't working hard enough and that the exports weren't competitive enough so that they needed to reduce and devalue the currency so that the exports could be more competitive. So that decision was made again, purely uh, so that they could see more export profit. And it was made against uh, the lifestyle of people who live there who would see their savings get cut in half. And obviously you'd have massive price inflation, things like that. So the outcome of these structural adjustment policies uh, that were necessary to implement if a country wanted to borrow, and often this is the only way it could, it could sort of short-term save itself, um, was essentially to like starve the people who live in that country. Mm. And the, 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 the tricky part or the sinister part was that typically... IMF structural adjustment policies and later World Bank policies were, the, I mean, people weren't dumb. They knew what would happen when when these loans were taken, when structural adjustment occurred. So this would be very unpopular. So over time, the IMF and World Bank, you know, basically very much preferred to work with dictators or any sort of unaccountable leaders because they didn't want to have to deal with like protests or hmm you know, a new government getting elected that wasn't such a fan. So generally speaking, the IMF, you know, never met a dictator it didn't like, essentially. I mean, going back to the roots, the creation of these institutions, they were funding colonial schemes. So they would give money to the Netherlands as it tried to put down Indonesia in the last days of its colonial empire. They would fund apartheid South Africa. They would fund imperial Rhodesia. They would fund um, all kinds of empires, uh, the Portuguese um, uh, in, in Southern Africa, um, sometimes to the extent where the United Nations would say, this is reprehensible, you need to stop. And the World Bank would say, no, we can't because the World Bank has some sort of clause where it would say something like, we can't get involved in the politics of the countries we lend to. So, you know, essentially like, you know, over time you had both at the beginning colonial and then later just sort of dictatorial borrowers. And the thing is these borrowers did, couldn't care less about the population. They weren't going to be the ones paying back the right. uh, interest. So a good example would be Mobutu in Zaire. So uh, Mobutu ruled for 30 years and the IMF would kept giving him money. There were often like obviously political factors at work here. Like during the Cold War, the U.S. wanted Mobutu, not some sort of communist uh, socialist uh, leader there, right? So we um, helped uh, assassinate the uh, sort of more left-leaning uh, democratically elected leader uh, in the Congo. And then we helped install Mobutu and then we supported him. And we would keep giving him these, these loans. And then when we when it would come time to pay back the loan, whether it be for a huge construction project funded by the World Bank or for uh, paying back a, a bailout from the IMF, 
Mabutu would basically say through his, through his spokespeople, like, sorry, we don't have the money. And then that, that gets us to a very interesting point in this whole uh, dynamic. And that's, okay, so the loan that was given to Zaire is an asset on a Western bank's balance sheet, ultimately. Mm -hmm. Like basically the World Bank and IMF borrow from Western banks again, and then they loan out. So there's a creditor here who has that as an asset on their balance sheet. They don't want that going to zero. They don't want to write it down. They don't want to like let the Congo go bankrupt. Like that's not what they want, right? That's not in their incentive, right? So what would they what they would prefer is just to create a new loan to cover the old one. So what would be preferred and what would, what ended up happening in the case of something like Congo is you would just have another loan come in to pay for the, the outstanding debt. Mm -hmm. And by the mid 70s, the bureaucrats at the banking fund knew that this was the case, that the only way all these poor countries could possibly pay back all the money they had borrowed was with new loans. So it became a literal Ponzi scheme. Um, now, this was okay, so to speak, in the 70s, um, interest rates relatively low. Um, there was a lot of money floating around due to the creation of the petrodollar. So these um, Gulf Arab oil exporters had more money than they could fathom. Um, and they were parking it in Western banks. Uh, and those banks had all this excess capital. They were looking to deploy it. And again, interest rates relatively low. Then they deployed it all across the global south. Um, and, and a lot of this was done through uh, intermediaries you know, like the bank and fund, et cetera. So, you know, the petrodollar system ended up kind of really catalyzing this effect of lending to the global South. You also had Robert McNamara, who was probably the most important leader of the fund or the bank ever. He was the leader of the bank in the seventies. And he, he, before then he, he was the secretary of defense of the United States. So he was responsible for sending all kinds of people, including my own father out to Vietnam. And then uh, he he later uh, and he came, he went from Ford Ford Corporation to the Secretary of Defense to head of the World Bank. Then to the when he retired in the eighty two, I believe, he went to the board of Royal Dutch Shell. Mm -hmm. So this was a it just tells you kind of that the the lending foreign aid industry is very much it's cl a lot closer to the military industrial complex than the one than 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 maybe people would like to admit another notable leader of the world bank was paul wolfowitz who previous to that had architected the iraq war um in the early 2000s so there's a lot of this going on a lot of like kind of proximity and and that makes sense because the bank and fund are very much part of us foreign policy and you know subjugate poor countries mm -hmm. um but anyway you had this realization that the only way that the system could keep going was with more debt and more debt and more debt. And again, this was made possible due to, first of all, the fiat system, the petrodollar, um, McNamara himself, like he sat there and he actually just sort of like said, we at the bank. And then the, again, because the bank and the fund share the same headquarters, the same people, the same ideas, they, they all sat there and, and dramatically increased the amount of money they were lending to poor countries in the 70s and early 80s. Um, and then you just had this kind of natural, like kind of low interest rate regime, right? So there was this explosion of um, debt being lent to the third world in the 70s and early early 80s. And there were to the point where like it, 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 it was like a bubble, like it was like the stock bubble of the late 20s or um, the, you know, dot com bubble or the subprime bubble, like you had mom and pop banks in the United States lending to like random countries in sub-Saharan Africa. It was mm. crazy. So you had this huge bubble of debt to the third world and then it popped. Right. And then it popped, right. Anytime you have a Ponzi, uh, it can pop. Right. So it popped because the U S government faced again, a crisis an internal crisis of the dollar. And the answer was to raise interest rates and U S interest rates, 81 were raised all the way up towards 20%. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine what that did for a lot of these poor countries. Um, so the, the, uh, what's called the third world debt crisis began in 82 with Mexico, Mexico defaulted. Um, and then just, just, you had a, just, a, just tons of other defaults all across Latin America, Africa, et cetera. Um, and you know, the system just sort of doubled down. Like what did it do when Mexico defaulted? It bailed it, you know, the system bailed it out with more new loans, right? Mm -hmm. So you had the size of the loans just continue to magnify. Mm 
Mm-hmm. So you had all this lending in the 70s, and then you had even more lending in the 80s to cover up the third world debt crisis. Then you had even more lending in the 90s to cover up the Asian financial crisis and the, new, and the, and the 94 peso crisis in Mexico, both of which were massive, much bigger than the third world debt crisis. And then... The, then the fiat, you know, the fiat system, it just sort of stumbles along and then it, 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 it get it kind of falls over and needs to get resuscitated each mm-hmm. time. It needs an, an even bigger infusion of debt. Mm-hmm. So the, the loans given out to sustain Latin America and Asia in the nineties dwarfed the loans given out in the eighties, which dwarfed the loans that given out in the seventies and what dwarfed the loans given out in the late nineties were the loans given out to European countries in in the early 2000, 2010s so the sovereign debt crisis in europe was the biggest of all so you basically had countries like greece poland iceland etc poorer countries in europe relatively speaking uh failing and then getting bailed out and those loans were even bigger than the loans given out to countries like indonesia south korea thailand during the 7 97 98 financial crisis so the imf and world bank's lending history has grown exponentially uh, since the early 70s. It, it literally looks like an exponential curve. I have these graphs in my essay if people are interested. Um, and today, you know, uh, the IMF's lending power stands at about a trillion dollars. The World Bank has more than $300 billion of loans scattered around the world. And, and when you look at individual countries, what you see is that, again, their debt trap is inescapable. I look at a country in in, in South Asia, Bangladesh, um, and this is a, a typical story. In, in the beginning of the fiat standard in the early 70s, this country had maybe $100, $100 million of external debt, which was sort of manageable at the time. It wasn't ideal, but it was manageable. Today, they have like $100 billion of external debt. Um, so they'll, they'll never be able to repay that, especially because this debt is denominated in dollars. You know, that's that's the sort of the the one key thing. And there was a a video floating around Bitcoin and crypto Twitter the other day of a guy named Michael Hudson, who you and I have discussed on your show before because we talked about his book Super Imperialism. Mm. And it's Michael Hudson describing the difference between like U.S. and African debt, and he's talking about the fact that these African countries they don't they, they their loans are denominated in dollars. And the only way that those countries can generate dollars to pay back the debt is by exports. So they end up having to export what we want, and then we give them dollars so that they can pay back their debt. And this has gotten so out of control. So I have two data points that are just kind of mind blowing. One is that an exa- Nigeria, the largest country in Africa, so so eighty percent of its revenue as a country. And yes, it's corrupt. Yes, it's authoritarian, all these things. But let's just consider that as it it is a nation state, right? So 80% of its revenue in 2022 went went to debt service. So you can imagine what that does for a nation. Instead of investing in its future, investing in entrepreneurial things, investing in sovereignty, investing in independence, they're literally just paying back debt. And this has been the case historically. Uh, I note in my essay... After Marcos, the dictator of the Philippines, was ousted in '86, after you know thieving and looting for decades uh, with the help of the IMF and World Bank, um, the Filipino people were saddled with his debt. And they didn't elect him; he he was right. a dictator, but they had to pay it. So 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 forty to fifty percent of the Filipino national revenues were going you know for years then going back to pay this debt that they didn't even they didn't borrow. Um, so essentially. You know, you have a situation where these countries are all in debt traps and they become dependent, right? So the other fact that's really crazy is that Africa today imports 85% of its food. And that's as a direct result of these sort of structural adjustment policies. Mm. And it flies in the face of what would happen in a normal free market. Like in a normal free market, countries would have you know comparative advantages and they would adapt accordingly. I mean, Africa should be a breadbasket for the world. Mm. Um, but because things have been centrally planned, um, you have countries like America, which are in power, which are basically able to control the world, and they centrally plan and manipulate the agricultural market. So America basically does this by subsidizing farmers in the United States, literally paying them, 
and also by erecting tariffs on imports from poor countries. So it makes it like really uncompetitive for, for these countries to, to do farming. So what, what has been a longstanding goal of US foreign policy since the, since the end of World War II has been to basically make as many countries in the world dependent on importing our agriculture. And this allows us to control them. So for example, if they do something that we don't like, we can just like withhold their wheat imports and then a lot of people die. This happened in Bangladesh in the 70s. So it gives us a hugely powerful weapon. So agricultural policy is incredibly, incredibly important. And it's very tied into this. So again, as a, as a result of these structural adjustment policies, you had countries being engineered away from focusing on industry and consumption agriculture to feed themselves and to sustain mm -hmm. themselves and to become independent. And you had them being steered towards um, exporting raw goods and materials for us to consume and foods that we want that aren't going to help the local population. You know, often the kind of foodstuffs and agricultural commodities recommended by the World Bank uh, in the 70s and 80s and 90s, etc. For these poor countries, were not even things they could eat. And and uh, listeners will start to realize this as they think through. Think about it: palm oil, cotton, mm -hmm. cocoa, tea, coffee, rubber. These are things that we basically we make we made loans to these countries to produce these things. Typically, the construction of those plantations or operations by the way, were, were uh, you know, uh, contracted and done and executed by Western companies. So you'd have the double loan effect where like the, the principal was, le was lent out, right, to like Ghana to do cotton or something like that. And the apparatus was constructed by an Italian company or something like that. So the money would go from the West to Ghana straight back to the West, okay? Mm -hmm. And then the West would get paid back as Ghana paid back the debt. This is what's called a double loan. So the double loan phenomena has been like, you know, all over the place. You know, I, as I quote in my essay, you know, you know, huge percentages of like whatever it would be aid or lending across the third world, you know, have come right back to, um, have come right, right back to, to, to the countries that made that lending in the first place. Mm -hmm. So, you know, these loans aren't being altruistic. They're not made in an altruistic sense. Like, you know, sort of to conclude this point, the, the bank and the fund were created selfishly, and and this was known by, you know, I quoted um, Nixon on this, uh, Kennedy, many others. Uh, they knew that the purpose of aid and development was 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 to aid America or to aid mm. Europe and not not to not to aid others. And in reality, it's a machine for sculpting economies so that they give us what what we need and and for like basically um, taking away their agency. Um, and that, that's, that's the result. Uh, I, I don't know if it's, there's no counterfactual, like is the interesting part. We don't have a world where this like didn't happen. Mm -hmm. Um, but when we think about all of the success we've had in the West with Western civilization and all the good things that we have, like the American revolution, um, civil liberties, free speech, like property rights, like all the cool things, all the helpful things that, that that we can claim credit for in Western civilization. Um, what's often not acknowledged is the fact that when you stand in a city like London or Paris or um, Madrid or New York and, or Tokyo, and you look around at the marvel around you architecturally, culturally, economically, um, yes, a huge part of that is Western civilization, Western values, let's say. Mm -hmm. um, individual rights, um, freedom, but also a lot of that was stealing from poor countries. Hmm. And I just don't think that that's like acknowledged enough. Well, brilliantly said, um, it, it strikes me as, I don't know, ironic, I guess that these institutions that were established for a temporary to be a temporary solution, right? Reconstruction or whatever it may have been after World War II, mm -hmm. they become permanent, of course. And then they also <laughs> right. become their opposite or at least opposite to their stated goal, as you said, with in, in poverty, I think. And bigger uh, than ever. And bigger than ever. This, they keep growing. And mm -hmm. I, you know, and it's fascinating that you I mean, it sounds like they're basically becoming institutions of social engineering and or economic manipulation. And, um, 
you know, what, what is the old saying? There's nothing more permanent than a temporary government solution. So this is just another mm -hmm. instance of that. And we're talking about very broken incentives because as you said, World Bank or IMF extends a loan, borrower is unable to repay. Obviously, in, the incentive of the creditor is to put another asset on its balance sheet by extending another loan rather than realizing a loss on a, on a bad loan. So you have that side of broken incentives. And then on the borrower side, you have these people coming into power, taking the loan, lining their pockets, and then ultimately, you know, leaving office or, or letting the debt load, leaving the debt load to be paid by someone else, which is often, if not always the citizens, I imagine ultimately paying it. Mm -hmm. Um, and then the, this, the economic restructuring thing is really mind blowing. I had no idea about this, but you're, you're basically, it's like, not only are you indebting these countries, but you are repurposing their economies to serve you. The you're reprogramming them. Yeah. You're reprogram. Yes. Socially, economically. And then that gives you the ultimate leverage to be able to just mm -hmm. record on, on food stuff or whatever. Yeah, and let's not be like, let's be clear. These countries were extremely poor before. Sure. It's just, it's just that like, when you looked at the poor, the global poor, let's say in India or something like that, Bangladesh, I mean, a hundred years ago, they were horrifically poor. Um, then there's been a lot of progress made in spite of, let's say the world bank, the IMF, like there's been technological progress. There's been mm -hmm. health progress. There's been innovation made so that people can live longer. Um, but I would say that's like sort of in spite of structural adjustment stuff. Yeah. Um, and if you think about these people, uh, yes, they were very poor before, but they were independent. They grew their own food. Mm. Um, and they were masters of their own destiny in their area, you know, mm -hmm. so to speak. Today, they're still really, really poor, relatively speaking, like compared to the 1% in their country, but they don't grow their own food. They're dependent. They need to buy it. And then what the problem is that the world is doesn't have a Bitcoin standard yet. There is no open standard for everybody. There's the fiat system, which is a dollar hegemonic system, which means that uh, you know, prices rise and rise and rise and rise for them. And, and their wages do not, they're sticky. Their wages do not go up the same way. So in a lot of cases, what, what's been really crazy is that due to structural adjustment policies in many, in many, you know, in large part between the sixties and the nineties, especially you had a lot of countries whose GDP per capita in real terms declined which is crazy to think about because these countries are all growing in terms of a body politic, like the number of people who, if you think about them as organisms, the number mm -hmm. of people in these countries were growing, but the amount of like economic life blood they were producing was being reduced. So this, this is, this is caused, this is called maldevelopment or, you know, mm -hmm. you think of it as malnutrition in, in an mm -hmm. individual human body. You could think of a nation state as a human body too. So what was happening is you, you, you were seeing life expectancy, drop, things like that. Um, there, there's a study I use in the paper of Mexico, which is a country that, you know, is a, is a good example of a developing country that, that, that has been sort of, you know, dependent on structural adjustment loans, things like that. And essentially when you, when you have a contraction of 2% in your GDP, the mortality rate of the country declines by 1%. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you have a hundred, you have a country of a hundred million people. Okay. You're talking a million deaths, right? Okay. Um, so when you talk about countries that had a, we're talking countries that, that had a GDP contraction of 10, 20, 30% at times over five to 10 to 20 year stretches, anywhere from the sixties to two thousands. I mean, we're, we're talking tens of millions of people were killed by these policies. Now, no one will ever go to prison. There'll be no accountability. Mm -hmm. In fact, the people who perpetrated these crimes are living large. They have buildings named after them. They're still working in the government. Um, former World Bank officials continue to work at high at high um, levels of the of the of the government. I mean, we look at like someone like Larry Summers, uh, you know, Larry, Larry Summers, um, you know, was the chief economist of the World Bank for, for, in the early 90s. He went on to be and that was that was at like that was at the height of if you want to like basically say 
that there was like a kind of a, a most obviously brazenly exploitative era of the bank and the fund. It was like the 1980s and early 90s. Mm. Since then, they've had to do some reforms. I still think that they largely just do the same thing, but they at least had to like apologize and stuff. Right. So at the at the peak of the kind of brazen exploitation of the bank and the fund, Summers was in charge. And then he goes on to be undersecretary of treasury for the United States. And then he becomes the secretary of treasury for Clinton, president of Harvard University. And then he was director of the economic council under Obama. And he's, you know, on Twitter now, you know, tweeting. So, I mean, these, these people will never get any, you know, never be any, be any accountability for this stuff. Mm. Um, but you know, it, I, I just felt like it was important to do this study so that people could understand these dynamics. Um, and I think what is kind of somewhat, and if you think about, again, to go back to, um, just one more thing before I move on to maybe some of the optimism is that, uh, again, the, these, these institutions created policies that used to be accomplished by traditional colonialism. So what, 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 again, what, what powered traditional colonialism was something called the drain. So the drain would drain like goods, cheap goods and labor from the periphery to the core. That's what it did. Right. Um, and if you actually look at the data, what's happening today and what's happened ever since 1982 is that the traditional way we would think about development and aid and assistance it has been reversed. So traditionally, the way we think about it is that it's rich countries sending money to poor countries. This is the way we think about it, right? And that was true for decades. But then you had these like, the, the, the reality that these are loans, these are credit, these are not gifts, right? right? And also interest rates skyrocketed, right? So since 82, uh, the flow of resources permanently reversed. So since 1982, uh, you know, let's say since like post-World War II era, as the new world came out of World War II, um, yes, you had rich countries, you know, lending money to poor countries, but in 82, the, the flow reversed. So the flow ever since has been rich, rich countries kind of sending money to poor, to, to sorry, poor countries sending money to rich countries. Mm -hmm. It started to, it started out as a couple billion dollars a year. Um, and now it's several trillion dollars a year. So for example, like in, this is, you know, I quote one person looked at the year 2012. So that year developing countries received 1.3 trillion, which included all income aid and investment, like all the money that went their way. But that same year, 3.3 trillion flowed out. Mm -hmm. And again, part of that is debt service. Part of that is the double loan effect, right? Like they, they borrow and then they immediately pay, pay the money back, but mm -hmm. they, but they continue to owe. Right. Um, some of that is capital flight, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But when you actually add up all the flows from 1960 to 2017, and, and I, I think obviously it'd be even greater if you went up to today, um, but from 60 to 2017, $62 trillion was drained out of the developing world. So that's the equivalent in, in real dollars of 620 Marshall plans. So if you thought about the Marshall plan as something that helped like rebuild and, and help make Europe independent and strong again, um, you could argue that was a good use of credit, right? Um, we're talking about 620 times that to impoverish the, the, the global South at the, at, at, you know, to, to benefit us. Um, and, uh, I mean, if you think about just the, the, the debt itself, so between 1970 and 2007, so that's from the end of the gold standard to the great financial crisis, uh, poor countries paid rich countries $7.15 trillion in debt service. Um, and if you actually just look at their debt again, I, I, as discussed, it's exponential, right? So um, you, you had individual countries going from owing a couple hundred million to owing a hundred billion. And in total, um, the external public debt of developing countries has gone from 46 billion, which is what it was at the beginning of the fiat standard to today is 8.7 trillion. Okay. So... Uh, I write that you have countries like India and the Philippines and Congo owing their former colonial masters 189 times what they owed it when the fiat standard began. Right. Um, and they, they've paid $4.2 trillion on interest payments alone since 1980. And, you know, this is the debt trap. And again, the crazy part about this and what drew me to this is that 
an overwhelming amount of this debt was borrowed by unaccountable leaders or dictators who didn't have the consent of their people to borrow this money. I mean, we could argue about democracy, but it's one thing if a relatively democratic country where there are labor unions and there are like ways for the people to express themselves at the ballot box. Mm. It's one thing if that country decides to take a loan from the IMF and the people generally agree that they need it or whatever. That's very different from a completely unelected dictator borrowing it without consulting the people. And if anybody disagrees, he kills them. This was literally happening for so long. And there's a term for this. It's called odious debt. And actually the United States invented it. Um, if you go back to the Spanish-American War, um, when we liberated Cuba from the Spanish Empire, uh, American courts and, and, and officials basically said that the debt that Cuba owed that was incurred by the Spanish Empire there, the Cuban people didn't have to pay because obviously that would be crazy because the Spanish Empire was subjugating them. So we've had this legal precedent of odious debt for like over a hundred years. Um, that would make sense. Like if you're enslaved by somebody and then you're, 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 you know, um, dominator gets thrown out, why should you have to pay the debt that they incurred often mm -hmm. at your expense? So I'm like morally, I, I'm totally behind the concept of odious debt. I think it makes sense. The thing is, ironically, the World Bank and IMF have never followed this precedent. So you, you, you had countless dictators that they were lending to on the claim that they couldn't get involved in local politics. And then the dictator would get overthrown or would die or whatever, and the people would be saddled with the debt. So this is part of a big part of the story of why this debt just keeps growing and growing and growing. I mean, you had the people of Argentina who are hold the, um, you know, like, um, let's say, um, sad crown of, 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 the, of being the record holder of largest loan ever borrowed from the IMF, mm -hmm. <laughs> which is uh, $57 billion just, just a few years ago in 2018. Um, they're still, I mean, what, what that loan did is it wiped out the debt that Argentina had, mm -hmm. which, which of course had been rolled up for decades, including borrowed by their former military dictators, et cetera. We're throwing people out of helicopters into the ocean, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, and then it indebted them even more. So if you look at the, there's actually this like website you can go to, uh, if you just type IMF history. Argentina, if you're following along in Google, IMF history, Argentina, the IMF does not, uh, it keeps like kind of the details of its loan secret, but they keep the like headline numbers public. So you can go there and look at all of these things. And every loan by the IMF is something called a standby arrangement. And again, that's a line of credit that is dispersed as a country meets certain, you know, kind of like neoliberal uh, or Washington consensus or mm -hmm. austerity milestones, right? And you can see, that they've received more than 20 of these loans from the IMF since 1959. And uh, you can see that uh, the the loan, the latest loan uh, was um, 40 billion SDRs. The SDR is the currency that the uh, IMF mints. Uh, it's pegged uh, on a basket of like, I think the dollar, the euro, uh, the yen, and one or two other currencies. But that's a, that was equivalent at the time to fifty-seven billion dollars. But but you can see that more than seventy-five percent of that was like um, outstanding. So th they they borrowed whatever fifty-seven billion. They still owe more than thirty billion. So it wiped out all the old debt by making a whole bunch of new debt. And that that that's that's the Ponzi system that we have. So um, the 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 and and the toll is. It's pretty astonishing when you think about um, like what ends up actually happening. Um, it, it, some of these analysts looked at the year 2015. So if we think about the inputs, the cheap goods and 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 services that are coming in from these poor countries to like subsidize the way of life in rich countries, um, in 2015 the drain, the colonial drain, was. 10.1 billion tons of raw materials and 182 million person years of labor. So that was 50% of all goods and 28% of all labor used by high income countries that year. So 182 about, million person years of labor. Yeah. Oh, 182 sure. million. Per, so, so that, that, that was 28% of all labor in, in, so, I mean, you had, I don't know, basically, um, 
something like, uh, you know, 550 million person years of labor, like in the developed, the developed world, in the industrial world. Uh, and a th almost a third of that was, was kind of like imported cheaply from the periphery and half of all the goods we used in our industry was imported. So if you can think about the drain or the subsidy that we get, I mean, you could think about, I mean, what, what would we be without half of the goods and a third of the labor? Right. I mean, I mean, we'd be screwed. I mean, our inflation would be super high and we wouldn't be able to do nearly what we could do. So it's just like some context. And the system, unfortunately, is designed in a way where there's no incentive for reform. Like I, I use the um, metaphor of a drug dealer, which is something that uh, a, a scholar named Cheryl Payer used back in the seventies when she first observed the IMF. Um, and then later in her book on the world bank, uh, um, she described um, the IMF and, and world bank as the drug dealers and debt as the drug and the dictators as the, addicts and n nobody nobody's got an incentive to change right the the imf and world bank and their creditors they want to continue to look to lend to these countries because it gives them power and it makes money for them mm -hmm. um and the addicts th they want more money you know because they don't they're just trying to they're just surviving day by day they're not thinking about the consequences mm -hmm. for their long term and there's no therapist. There's no one who's going to be like, hey, maybe you shouldn't take that loan. Maybe you should think of a different way to like, no, 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 no. Right. There, there's no one there to do that. So if if we just have this fiat system forever, it will just continue to grow and continue to have these horrible, horrible cataclysmic crashes. Right. One is currently happening right now. Like the reason, I, one of the reasons I wrote the piece is that we're seeing another third world debt crisis. I mean, mm -hmm. people who are following probably saw you know, people swimming in the swimming pools of presidents in Sri Lanka and Iraq and other places. Like there's leaders being overthrown. There's countries collapsing. Um, there's the IMF stepping in into places like Egypt and Ghana and Argentina mm -hmm. making huge new loans. Like it's all sort of happening again. And, and part of that is ironically because of the U S government, you know, look, we issue the reserve currency and, and we don't take responsibility for our decisions when we issue that stuff. So, mm -hmm. okay. So now we're going to, so we're going to decide to jack the rates, right? Okay. So we're going to decide to jack the interest rate, the bedrock global interest rate from like what? It was 0.3%. Now it's going to be 5%. I mean, that's that's crazy. So um, whether or not I think that's a good idea or responsible for the US economy is, a, is, is different from the fact that we, meaning we, meaning the US government, the Federal Reserve and the White House, like work to solve domestic problems without regard for what that does for people abroad. Like Volcker, when he raised rates to like save the dollar or whatever back in the early 80s, like he obviously wasn't being compassionate or empathetic for the untold, you know, hundreds of millions of people whose lives he was wrecking by increasing the cost of capital artificially high really fast. So that's happening again. So you've got you know, and, and I don't, I, I'm not going to pretend to know the difference, but, um, other, others who are more knowledgeable than me can tell you, but you know, okay. Going from like 8% to, to 18% or whatever we went, you know, on the global bedrock rate of, of the cost of capital in the early eighties, you know, I mean, going from 0.3 to 5% is also really bad. I mean, I, I, I don't, I think they're apples and yeah, I think they're apples and oranges, but like they're both really bad. We'll put it that way. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, CrowdHealth. CrowdHealth is a Bitcoin enabled alternative to legacy health insurance. Now let's face it. Legacy health insurance is an absolute scam. Nobody can explain this better than the legendary comedian, Chris Rock. Insurance. You got to have some insurance. You got to, there's an insurance. They shouldn't even call it insurance. They should just call it in case shit. <laughs> like, I give a company some money in case shit happens. <laughs> now, if shit don't happen, shouldn't I get my money back? <laughs> <laughs> so with CrowdHealth, instead of just paying premiums that you'll never see again, you can hold part of this pool of savings in dollars and in Bitcoin through CrowdHealth. And when you have a health event, you can draw against this pool of communal savings. 
So go to joincrowdhealth.com slash breedlove to learn more or sign up. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, Wasabi Wallet. Wasabi lets you use Bitcoin privately while still maintaining full control over your money. Specifically, Wasabi Wallet is an open source, non-custodial wallet with privacy built in by default. By using Wasabi, you're effectively putting the private back in private property. Wasabi Wallet is an easy to use privacy wallet that can support any amount of Bitcoin transactions. So go to wasabiwallet.io today to download the state of the art wallet software. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, Bitcoin Conference 2023. This three day event will be held May 18th through 20th in Miami Beach. Uh, This is going to be the biggest event of the year, as it always is. And the past two years in Miami have simply been amazing. Uh, Day one's industry day. Days two and three are going to be open to general admission. And I'd say this is a great place to go and network with Bitcoiners or even look for a job. Uh, Just a really all around great experience. There's a fantastic speaker lineup, including Michael Saylor, Zoltan Pozar, Lynn Alden, Alex Gladstein, many others. And last year we did a 10 million sats giveaway for this event, and we're going to do it again this year. So to get discounted tickets and enter for a chance to win 10 million sats, go to b.tc slash conference slash 2023 and use code BREEDLOVE. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, Casa. Casa makes it simple to buy and secure your Bitcoin without wondering whether you're doing it right. Specifically, Casa provides a multi-key custody solution, which is by far the most secure way to custody your Bitcoin. Now, when I talk about Bitcoin being theft proof money or inviolable private property, a multi key custody model is exactly what I am talking about. Using multiple keys lets you maintain full control of your Bitcoin while also giving you redundancy in case you lose one of the keys. It's also the best way to secure your Bitcoin for inheritance planning purposes. So go to keys.casa, that's C A S A today to sign up and use discount code breedlove so you're seeing like entire national currencies just totally collapse right now losing half their value in a year Mm -hmm. so you're seeing the standards of living they're going to go down you're going to see contractions in gdp right and again remember when you see big contractions in gdp the mortality rate is going to go up it's going to rather the mortality rate is going to decline or deteriorate in these countries and lots of people are going to die. And that's what happens. I mean, there's not, there's not, it's, this is not a costless decision. I mean, I think that this is, mm-hmm. you know, you, you always see like people talk about, uh, Oh, the rates are going to go this way or that it's going to do this or that. I mean, they don't talk about people are going to die. Like that's right. just not something that they, they talk about, but this is a, you know, an internal looking decision. And because we're on this fiat standard where one country gets to mint the currency, anytime it makes a decision to try and like write its own ship, it drowns everybody else. Like this is just yeah. one of the reasons I'm a Bitcoiner is I believe in a, a future where that's not possible and we're all kind of on the same standard. So, you know, if we think about the drug metaphor and we think about the fact that there's no incentive uh, for, for the dealer to stop dealing to the addict, um, the only way this could change as a paradigm shift in my opinion. And what's funny is I think the Marxists knew this. Like what was funny is a lot of the firsthand research I used was, was leftist or Marxist. Um, Cause I think that in many ways they analyze the problem really well, like yes. Michael Hudson being a great yeah. example, their solution is terrible. I mean, it's the exact opposite of what it needs to be, right? It, well, it's funny as property they, versus make it stronger. Well, well, well they keep pointing out how, corrupt these dictators are in these third world countries. And then they just say, oh, the solution is to give them, give them the power back. It's like, that's not going to help. Right. That's not going to, that's not the solution. Right. So they always, they never had a solution, but their analysis is really illuminating in many ways. I mean, some of, some of it's obviously bad, but some, some of it's really, really interesting and you learn a lot. Right. So uh, I think that's, you know, got to be open-minded here when we look at our research. I also learned a lot from libertarian thinkers mm-hmm. um, in my research. Uh, the Cato Institute published some really great stuff on the bank and the fund in the nineties, obviously, you know, then you had Republicans who just thought the bank and fund were a waste of taxpayer money. So there were a lot of critics of the bank and fund over the years. Mm-hmm. Um, at, at Saifedean's, Saifedean Amusa's book, the fiat standard has an awesome section on the, what he calls the misery industry. Um, 
which is what I'm talking about here. And, you know, so you have Austrian, you have libertarian, you have Republican, you have, and then you have leftist and you have Marxist critics. So usually when like such a diverse group of people are all like unified on something, it means they're probably right. So, um, but the point is that like there, there was never really like a way out. Um, and now we have Bitcoin, right. And I don't know what ends up happening, but it strikes me that if we did have a Bitcoin standard, this is not possible. The, the IMF World Bank post-1971 system, it's not possible to, to sustain because right. the only way it works is through the ability to uh, create new money for bailouts. Right. And as Saifedean told me, like, okay, so we're going to bail out this country with $30 billion. Like, let's say the U.S. taxpayer agrees and we send it through the IMF or World Bank or whatever. Um, I mean... Today, that's paperwork. We can just file the money and we can we can allocate the billions. But on a Bitcoin standard, it's like, yeah, who you and whose Bitcoin is gonna is gonna exactly. send thirty billion to Brazil? And I don't know what happens to the the World Bank and IMF in a Bitcoin standard. I think mm-hmm. that, um, you know, maybe maybe they survive and they just become a lot more careful and cautious, and they have mm-hmm. to ask, you know, they, they they have to basically be more, you know. Prudent. rigorous um, and prudent. Yeah. yeah. Um, maybe they decide to stop charging interest. I, I don't know. I mean, maybe, maybe they're turned into literal charitable organizations. I'm not sure what ends up happening, but they can't possibly do what they've done. I mean, the, you, you know, the, the, what's going to start to happen is that you start to realize that the biggest bubble of all, you know, wasn't the dot com bubble, wasn't the subprime bubble wasn't the stimulus bubble. It's it's been the sovereign debt bubble and and mm-hmm. the and the um the uh lender of last resort you know is the IMF, right? Mm-hmm. And it just continues to prop up this bubble. And there's trillions of dollars of this net sovereign debt out there. And so much of it is odious. So much of it was issued without consultation of, of the people. I mean, you could even extend this to the United States in a way like I've written about how since since the 1960s, um, all of our wars have been paid by borrowing through deficit spending, mm-hmm. um, not through taxes or through bonds. So so kind of without consulting the people, mm-hmm. right? So um, I think that uh, I know it's just it's just it's it's interesting to ponder that. I mean, you know, uh, I, I truly believe that if you're going to have some sort of fiat system. It, it, the issuance of that has to be done kind of really like in consultation with a widest variety of people as possible. And because like no one is consulted, then we could just do like debt monetization to fund like imperial right. wars in Asia, like now, right? That's like what we're doing. Um, like we're not paying that in taxes or with bonds. It's being paid for uh, through cancel on effects and ultimately through through inflation and through asset inflation. Yeah, um, w- which is universally... A violation of private property, right? This is you're violating the private property of dollar holders through debasement to fund these shenanigans, for to use a light term. But uh, the the key problem seems to be that the World Bank and IMF these are lenders that cannot take loan losses, right? They they can always, as you said, it's just paperwork. Yeah, issue another loan. N- it's well, funny they money. could no. Well, they could. I mean, there is a movement to abolish debt. Yeah, and for like the tiniest, poorest countries, which of course, from a percentage basis, make up a tiny amount of the debt portfolio of the IMF World Bank, mm-hmm. there is a program for debt relief. Um, again, we're talking a small percentage of the outstanding debt, but of course, the countries that apply for this thing have to go through structural adjustment. So it's sure. like you know, you can never right. you can never escape the squeezing the squeezing yeah. of your economy but the, the for deeper... everything that you're worth. The deeper solution, as you said earlier, is that it's Bitcoin, right? You have to have money that has meaning involved. Like it's, it's one thing to send a country thirty billion dollars in Bitcoin that you might not ever get back. I mean, there's very, there's skin in the game for the lender at that point. But if it's fiat and you've got lender of the yeah. last resort backing you forever, there's no disincentive to lend. So what do we get? An explosion in global debt, well, and all the social engineering and economic manipulation that comes with it. I think it's a process that's going to take decades, but China is, I'll bring up China for a second. It's very interesting. China tried, China obviously is trying to copy the world bank, the IMF through their own activities. They lend a lot. They lend, Mm -hmm. um, these days sort of almost at par, sort of at par with, uh, the IMF world bank complex. Um, 
they're lending about 85 billion per year to the global south etc it's more than 100 countries um and they don't issue the reserve currency so what, what we're starting to see is okay in a bull market they're like you can kind of sustain this um but 90 percent of what china lends is 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 credit it's not gifts it's not aid um and those countries are just like going to be unable to pay china back okay mm -hmm. so then china has some options okay china can confiscate or national or like kind of seize like like mm -hmm. like state state telecom or a port or something mm -hmm. um but like then it needs to like hire the security guards and militarize the thing and th there's like there's going to be a limit to like how much they want to actually confiscate and what you're starting to see is like them tr starting to retreat from some of these projects like like basically there's limits to what you can do if you don't um mint the reserve currency hmm. if you mint the reserve currency you can you can you can um perpetrate this. yeah well you can perpetrate the scam for decades and decades and decades yeah. Um, because you can just mint the reserve currency. If you don't mint the reserve currency, you can't do this, in, in my sort of opinion. I mm -hmm. think that's what's made this become so grotesque in many ways. You have ways. a much broader tax base when you mint the reserve currency in terms of using inflation yeah. as taxation, right? $4 billion users worldwide, that's the tax base of the U.S. government when they print money. And I'm, I'm compiling U.S. government yeah. federal reserve here, but... yeah. And I, important to note that, like, I, this isn't a, a critique of aid necessarily. I think the aid industry has its uh, like aid meaning uh, money given out without, you know, without being needed to pay back. Mm -hmm. That's got its own issues of dependency and uh, its own flaws that I'm also critical of. But that's kind of a different conversation. Um, I'm not here to like attack like you know donating to a country when it, you know, when it experiences an earthquake or something. I think that's mm -hmm. a noble and good thing to do. Provided we can find uh, an efficient and non-corrupt, you know, way to get the money there, and I, obviously, I think Bitcoin helps there too. Um, but, but in general, um, what we're talking about here is development and assistance globally, and this is credit, um, mm -hmm. and this is a credit thing, uh, um, and these are loans, and uh, you know, these loans are going to get really expensive this decade, and that's going to be really complicated, and it's going to result in a lot of these poor countries, like having to pay like a higher and higher and higher percentage of the revenue on debt, debt service. And I just think that that just drives them deeper and deeper and deeper into impoverishment and away from independence and sovereignty. And it's not really clear how they get out of this. Um, right. Now, maybe there is some sort of Bitcoin thing where over time they invest more in like Bitcoin mining infrastructure, Bitcoin economy, they build a Bitcoin reserve. Um, and I think in many ways, that's why, uh, the IMF has been critical of El Salvador is it's like pushing forward a, an alternative. I, I, I've been very critical of Bukele, uh, for different reasons, but I've always, I've always supported El Salvador's choice of Bitcoin as a, as a second currency and as a different way to raise money than having to borrow from the IMF and World Bank from day one. I thought that was really cool and a great example for the rest of the world. I think over the coming decade, you're going to see more and more countries explore mining Bitcoin, um, because look, it, it's a permissionless way to mint. Like if you think about a world in a Bitcoin standard, all of a sudden any country can permissionlessly mint the reserve currency by converting energy into Bitcoin. Mm. Um, now they can't they can't all do it at the same scale. Obviously, mm. Russia is going to be able to convert a lot more mm -hmm. than Malawi, um, but. I, it does give some sort of equal footing. Like today, there is none at all. There's no equality at all. Like mm. if you're Malawi, you you can you can mint precisely zero of that currency um, because you have to export to get dollars because the world reserve currency is dollars and you can't make dollars. And if you do something that displeases uh, the powers that be, your access to dollars gets cut off and, and then your people starve. So I think that we need a different world where there's one mon one monetary standard uh, that that can't be manipulated in this way. It doesn't solve all the problems, but I think yeah. it gets a lot us a lot closer to to a just world. And I think it 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 just hinders this exploitative force that we've seen for you know seventy years or so. This neocolonial force, which which inhibits the growth of these countries, which forces them to focus on providing things for rich countries. Uh, so that they can earn dollars to pay back their debt at the expense of growing food for their own people to eat mm. and growing industry to create stuff. Um, if you think about the way that 
Japan or the United States or um, China, or whatever, if any of these countries became dominant, um, you know, through growing industry that other countries want, um, you know, it, it, it wasn't necessarily, um, you know, selling cotton, you know, that's not, that's not the way that you get a dominant power. So we're, we're kind of like really keeping a lot of the countries down through this. And again, I think that, that this only really is possible with the fiat system. I think that yeah. parts of it are, I mean, look, you could, you could still, again, you could still conceivably have a development bank operated by the U S and, and a lender of last resort of sorts, but they, they would just be like much more limited in what they could do. They'd have to be a lot more prudent. Um, and again, I, I, I always think about this, like, so safety said that, um, any country that, um, basically industrialized, uh, you know, before it got fiat is doing pretty well in any country that had to industrialize after fiat is not as mm -hmm. interesting, like way to put it basically. Um, and another way to put it is that, um, you know, if you have like a sound money standard, um, you know, you sort of have to resort to violence to, um, to exploit. So that's what was happening during colonialism, right? Mm -hmm. Like you had, you had more or less of sound money standard, but you had brazen, you know, brazen violence. Mm -hmm. You had brazen, brazen. Th so today in today's world, we're like brazen violence is like less, less, less accepted and less appropriate. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, we, the powers that be have resorted to uh, an unsound money system, uh, to mm -hmm. perpetrate their theft. Right. That's so I'm interested to see what a world looks like where it's post colonial and post fiat. Right. I just think that's going to be a world where you kind of have the best of both where in terms of like brazen colonialism is not acceptable. And also the financial colonialism that countries have perpetrated for decades is also not possible. So I'm right. pretty excited for that world. So at the end of the day, I'm like optimistic, but man, writing this thing was really jarring and <laughs> yeah soul searching and dark. I mean, but I think there's that quote. It's like, um, to get to the light, you have to go through the darkness and yes. it's very important. Yeah, absolutely. I've, I've had similar experiences writing about totalitarianism. It, it can darken the soul during the writing process. Um, totally. I think that's a the really good point you made there towards the end that a physical, I think key point though, a physical sound money system sort of invited, uh, overt violence right? Where you had outright colonialism, but it will be interesting to see what a non-physical sound money Bitcoin standard system would do where yeah. when you start to try and perpetrate violence against the country to confiscate resources, you'd actually drive people into the non-physical store of value and that, you know, they would flee presumably with a lot of, well, a lot of wealth also they were only have otherwise. There were also only certain areas where you could really mine gold. And then there were, because of gold's physical nature, first of all, there were only certain areas where you could mine it. And second of all, it made it easy to like centralize for custody yes. purposes. Yeah. Um, now we have a new technology that can be mined absolutely anywhere um, with, you know, God, I mean, ways to mine Bitcoin. We, we, we can't even possibly conceive will be done over the, over the coming and the decades. ways to custody Bitcoin and, and the ways to custody it. Yeah. Um, you know, the large, the large percentage of Bitcoin is not held by governments right. or large corporations necessarily. It's held by people. Um, and if we can find ways to keep that balance, uh, then, then, you know, maybe we have a different future. I, I mean, I, it's, it's worth it. I mean, look, I went to the Africa Bitcoin conference in, um, Ghana in December of 2022. Yeah. And I, um, I was very inspired by what I saw. I mean, I think you have people here who are extremely knowledgeable about what the IMF World Bank do, how the financial system in Africa is still like very colonial. This fact I learned there was really mind blowing. Like 80% of all inter-African payments are processed by an American or Western company. Like that's like so much rent seeking. So basically the, the financial system in Africa, again, which Africa is the same size as China, 1.4 billion people, um, is was designed to intermediate, uh, not to connect. It was designed to siphon out resources and to rent seek. So now we have a new financial system being built by Africans uh, on the Bitcoin standard, like using the Lightning Network and using different Bitcoin businesses that that is trending in the other direction. It's trending away from rent seeking and various intermediation and monopolies. And it's an open standard. Anyone can compete. And really like what, I, what we're seeing so far, at least, is that competition drives down the cost for the user. 
Mm -hmm. gives them more choices, which is really quite diff different than the old system. And, you know, maybe, maybe that's where we say this term capitalism is kind of a confusing term because if you want to use like, so the leftists would use the word capital capitalism to describe our current system. Right. Mm -hmm. And, um, Part of me says, I can't really deny that. Obviously, in a Cold War lens, like America was a capitalist power. The Soviet Union was a communist power. Like, I'm not going to debate that. Mm -hmm. But when you start to realize that, as obviously you've covered quite well, that like the entire global financial system is centrally planned um, mm -hmm. and that the cost of capital is planned and all these things are planned um, and coordinated, despite what I know some people say, um, it's quite obvious that they're the game is rigged. Um, and that if you look at world trade, that world trade is not free, that there are massive tariffs on um, everything from agriculture to steel to cotton. Um, the, the game is not an equal playing field. Um, then is it fair to call this capitalism? Do you know what I mean? Mm. Um, you know, I don't know. I like Alan Farrington's essay a lot. Uh, this is not capitalism. It's fabulous. Part of his Bitcoin is Venice book. Um, and I think that's sort of the case here as well. Like, I, I don't think I'd call the IMF World Bank capitalist. I mean, maybe you call them crony capitalist or something like that. But um, I think we can have a different system with different incentives. Um, whatever our system is today, it's true that it's not it's not necessarily communist or whatever. But it's it's it it, it is sort of crony capitalist in that it 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 sort of incentivizes these monopolies and these dis, these sort of systems where like the power powerful can dominate the weak. Right. Um, and again, like on a global context, you have the global cancel on effect and, and you have these larger, more powerful countries taking advantage of weaker ones through uh, currency domination. Um, so I hope that in, we can have a different standard moving forward. Yeah. I think a simple way to look at that, because I agree that the, we get engaged in these terminological debates and people want to say that's not real capitalism or this is not real socialism or whatever. I, I like to put the whole uh, rubric under the umbrella of statism, right? That every form of economic organization we've had has occurred under a state up until this point. And, you know, quite simply with the central bank, if you consider that money is one half of every transaction, then if you have a central bank, which is the central planning of money banking and the interest rate, then you are one half socialist, right? Just, mm -hmm. just very simply, right? So we, again, as we talked about offline, it, a lot of people's perception is that we have Soviet Russia on one end of this mm -hmm. polarity and U.S. capitalism on the other, but it's much more like U.S. statism, state capitalism, if you will, is somewhere in the middle and the true other end of Soviet communism would be like a Bitcoin standard, like a pure capitalistic world where, you know, the government that governed best actually governed least versus what we well, have today in fiat it, world it, with government overgrowth. hundred percent. And I, I, ironically, it's almost like a horseshoe because you could also say that communism didn't actually give workers full control or rights or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, there was in any sort of implementation it was totalitarian in nature mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. um, or at least authoritarian and what's ironic i guess is that bitcoin is i think will end up being 50 60 70 years from now kind of universally regarded as the best possible like wage protection technology yes so if you're like a worker and you want to preserve the fruit of your labor and avoid what's called surplus value being extracted from you um, mm -hmm. then earning in Bitcoin and saving in Bitcoin is going to be a massive tool for you. Right. So funnily enough, some of the more redeeming aspirations of socialism or Marxism, um, I think will end up being uh, enforced by Bitcoin, just as the wonderful qualities of free market capitalism that we seek, I think will also be enforced. Um, yeah. It'll I, I kind of be like a, you, like a horseship horseshoe in a way. Yeah. It's a bit of a, a fusion of opposites in a way. And that both capitalism and communism have their own ideals that we've never seen mm -hmm. fully realized in the world. Um, but I've actually, uh, I agree with, I've read some of the, the, the Marxist authors as well, and they really do a good job articulating the problem, but the Mark, you know, 
which was this um, divisiveness between classes, this, uh, you know, economic, let's say, corruption or, or stratification, right? That was kind of the problem that they saw in the world, uh, strife between classes. But the, and I'm, I'm, I'm sympathetic to that, but when they, they propose the solution as the abolition of private property, I think that is precisely the opposite solution you need. What you need is really strong private property. And that yeah. holds all of these other things at bay, right? All of these inflationary forces. But but you need bank, but you need bank, you need non what what you didn't have before Bitcoin was non-selective private property. Exactly. The problem and private again, property I like, independent of the state. Exactly. And we've never really had that before Bitcoin. And yeah. I, I think that um again, like I don't want to like discredit the incredible things Western civilization has accomplished. And you know, even just a half measure of private property in terms of like rule of law in a democ yeah. in a democracy yeah. is remarkable and defi and defines us in many ways from authoritarian societies um but uh where the marxists you know i think are correct is they they basically you know point out that this is selective and, yes. and you know the, the the government will just sort of acknowledge some private property rights but not others right exactly and they What's tend the to, and they tend to acknowledge yes. the private property rights of the rich against right. the private property rights of the poor, and right. that's why I t find myself often identifying as a progressive because I see wealthy people get treated with a different standard than poor people, um, and not that is not only the case on a global level when it comes to countries, but of course in our own communities wherever we live, um, you have people get put in prison and, and honestly like get killed in America yeah. before uh, they die in custody. And then you have wealthy people living out on bail, you know? Right. Right. Like yeah. in, their, no. in their parents, parent, in their parents' homes or whatever, yes. right, wherever, right. wherever SBF is going to be for the next year <laughs> in cushy, you know, uh, Silicon Valley hanging out like in yeah. the beautiful weather. I, it's, a, so, it's a great, you know, great point you make. I'm actually further sympathetic to the Marxist authors now, given that Bitcoin did not exist because private property well, was didn't... not working in its current implementation, but I'll also give more credence to the libertarian philosophers for holding yeah. true to that, no matter what, even if it didn't exist, they knew that well, private the property was, was the, the gold... only solution. Uh, well, the answer in part was the gold standard, but yes. th that was just, that was stripped out of our hands. Yes. Um, it was, it was stolen. Um, yeah. And, you know, you think about, well, what would be without Bitcoin, what would be the best national standard? It's very difficult. I mean, yeah. you could think of like, some sort of gold standard, but obviously gold was defeatable. Um, yes. as we covered on the last, the last time I was here about yeah. a year ago, we covered this. Um, so maybe Bitcoin's not defeatable. Maybe it can play a role here. Um, but I think we need new language to describe what Bitcoin's going to be and what's going to do. I agree with whether that. it be Bitcoinism or something. I mean, it's not, I've been calling I, it I guess sovereignism. Is, <laughs> yeah. I mean, like you and I might agree that this is not capitalism, like our yeah. current system, but like, you know, 5 billion people, think it's capitalism so right. that's going to be tough so i think what jeff booth told me was really interesting he because because we, we just don't have the words to describe this new emergent world yet because it doesn't no. exist but um forced cooperation is something he, mm. he he is term he he brought up which i thought was really interesting hmm. um which i think is just kind of true in terms of like what the kind of structures that I think are going to be end up built and somewhat Bitcoin. paradoxical at the surface, right? This idea of right. forced right. cooperation and Bitcoin, I think is very interesting in this regard that it a unifies opposites in many ways. I think if we looked at this schism philosophically between capitalism and socialism, capitalists really are about rewarding the strong, right? Rewarding the productive people that actually, um, the industrious people that create satisfaction of wants for other, they should be able to keep what they earn, so to speak. But philosophically, the the communist or Marxist perspective, at least ostensibly, was premised on protecting the weak, right? Preventing people that were not as industrious or economically successful from being preyed upon by the successful capitalists, let's say. And it seems like if we look at the if we're looking at the world correctly through a Bitcoin lens in the future, that we do get kind of both of those outcomes, right? You get stronger capitalism, people able to keep what they earn, preserve purchasing power across time. But you should, this should also work in favor of the weak in that it inhibits these schemes like the IMF and world bank. Yeah. I mean, and and it bank doesn't, in general. It, it's a limiting force. I mean, it's not going to change the dynamics we've had of the dominant 
exploiting the, right. the weak, but but it, it's going to be a limiting force. And when we talk about forced cooperation, I, I think an example, which is pretty brilliant, a product launch that came out of the Africa Bitcoin conference was really interesting. Um, so Bernard Para is a Nigerian entrepreneur who runs a, a Bitcoin exchange and an app called Bitnop. And Bernard has figured out a way to establish kind of like off ramps uh, into Kenyan M-Pesa, which is like a mobile money used by most mm -hmm. Kenyans, um, as well as Ghanaian MTN, which is a mobile money used there, as well as Nigerian bank accounts. So basically, like people can use his um, software to like send Bitcoin, and then it like materializes as M-Pesa like a minute mm -hmm. later. It's like amazing. Um, so he announced. Uh, in Africa, uh, along with Jack Mahler's, uh, uh, a, a partnership with Strike, a U.S. company. So now Jack Mahler was describing this on stage there, like a client of Strike in America who only has a U.S. debit card um, can th can choose to go in the app and choose send globally. And like within minutes or whatever, a minute or two, um, with essentially like no fee or almost no fee at all, that uh, amount of money is like arrives in someone's M-Pesa account or Nigerian bank account or Ghanaian MTN account. And that's possible because these two companies, Strike and Bitnob, are speaking the Bitcoin language together. Mm -hmm. And the reason I think this is important for forced cooperation is it forces the companies to use, uh, I mean, not that they wouldn't want to in the first place, but it forces them to use the real rate of exchange, which is so mm -hmm. important. So for a country like Nigeria, the government has a manipulated rate of exchange, which is the official rate. So for example, you would get like, let's say 425 Naira per dollar, let's say, is the official rate. But on the street, you can get 750 because mm. the Naira is actually worth a lot less than the government says, right? Mm. So this is the case all over the world. There's so many different fiat currencies. So the cool part about Bitcoin is if you use Bitcoin or a Bitcoin company <coughs> to send like if you go into, if you send five bucks to, which I did, like to Bernard, I sent five bucks over strike to Bernard for my strike credits to him. It arrives in like minutes in his Nigerian bank account and he gets 750 or so Naira per dollar. So he gets a lot more Naira in his Naira account. Right. He literally gets 750 times five or whatever. If you try to use Western Union or any of these like a quote unquote official non Bitcoin ways of sending the money, mm. um, you you get four hundred twenty five per dollar. Right, right, right. So, so this you're is circumventing Bitcoin, central planning. Yes, yeah. You're, yeah. So Bitcoin connects two different fiat pools, but like mm. in a way that's kind of unprecedented. Right. And you know that's one outcome of Bitcoin is that on its way to replacing fiat, it improves fiat in certain aspects, which is kind of interesting. Um, <laughs> things that Satoshi could never have predicted. Yeah. Uh, you know, probably couldn't have predicted that it would allow like, like you know, you know, people to like monetize stranded energy in like right, rural right, right. Africa. Yeah. Also, probably didn't predict this, but I thought that was a really interesting outcome, and I think forced cooperation is a good general kind of phrasing to think about how things might happen in the future. Like these institutions, the World Bank, the INF, they may be sort of forced to to be more cooperative and less exploitative, which yeah. which I think is uh, kind of something to hope for. Yeah, the positive externalities are super fascinating. It's almost like I tweeted this recently, Bitcoin's not a belief system, it's a veracity system. So it's just telling the truth all the time. And one of the second order consequences of that is what you just described, right? That you just get a truthful exchange rate when you're transacting over an app versus going through, um, I guess, official well, and, and, public and, and one rates. One grand irony, which I point out in my essay, which is really interesting, is that, and again, I don't think Satoshi could have predicted this, um, the countries that have been screwed over the most by the IMF and the World Bank are also the countries with the highest per capita Bitcoin use. Mm. So people are like escaping the system. Yeah. Like, right. and it's cool because people couldn't, like in the 80s, like during the third world debt crisis, like you didn't, I mean, if you were like a, in a poor community in Mexico or Brazil, like what was your escape? Like you didn't, there was no access to, mm -hmm. couldn't get dollars. Like, you were forced to, to rise and fall with the fiat that you had. Um, today, the poor, quote unquote, in Kenya or wherever, in those same countries in Mexico, Brazil, they can access 24-7 global uh, financial market and they can 
do commerce and trade and all these things mm-hmm. like using a phone in a way that was not possible for it's really mm-hmm. interesting to think about so you start seeing like basically the um uh the top uh couple like countries that in terms of per capita use use of cryptocurrency and bitcoin you have I think the top eight, seven of them are like chronic IMF borrowers. So Thailand, Nigeria, Philippines, Turkey, Argentina, Indonesia, Brazil. Yeah. That's seven of the top eight in terms of percent of internet users aged 16 to 64 who own Bitcoin or some form of cryptocurrency. Uh-huh. And we're talking somewhere between 20, somewhere between 16 and 20% of internet users in those countries, like already like <laughs> learning about using Bitcoin. Yeah. So it's like this irony of like the countries that need it the most are, are, you know, people are finding Bitcoin there and that, that also gives me some hope. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this all, it seems to me like human action comes down largely to incentives. And obviously if you are a victim of one of these schemes, you have the mm-hmm. greatest incentive to learn about and adopt something like Bitcoin to escape, right? It's a means of survival for you. Whereas it may just be a speculative bet for someone living in a safe Western liberal democracy. Um, but if the trajectory of history is any indication, like that pain will come, right? The pain's already here a little bit. We have more 40 year record highs and in inflation. Yeah. Um, I mean, things will get, I worse. don't think that, I mean, the thing is we need to know that this is going to be painful no matter what, like, yeah. you know, either the system unwinds or it continues to just, fester like either the debt continues to climb or it starts to unwind and we start to deleverage right and and that's not fun for anyone either right so the transition unfortunately out of the fiat standard is messy and painful for a lot of people um but like better to go to rehab than to die you know that's right so um, um, that's i guess the idea the best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago. The second best time is today. You just need it. Well, I, and I think it's difficult. Cause like, look, I mean, I was not born in a developing country. Like oh. I, I, I can't speak for these people and they often might say, we don't care. We need the money now or else we're going to die. And, and that's mm-hmm. a pretty legitimate viewpoint. And I can't really yeah. argue against it. What I, what I know is that it's bad for them to keep borrowing. Mm-hmm. because it's plunging their country deeper and deeper into debt. Um, but you know, every life is important. And I understand that perspective. It's very, very difficult to, to, to grapple with that. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah. It's a very pernicious problem and they're trapped in a vicious cycle, right? More borrowing begets the need for more borrowing, more misallocated capital, um, and more dependence ultimately on the creditor. And that exactly doesn't work in the long run, obviously, but, the urgency of needing to eat now typically outweighs such long-term abstract considerations. Um, I want to read, if you don't mind, just one excerpt here, just sure. to give the audience an idea of the writing. And uh, I think it's a pretty strong point. You wrote that, uh, and this is just in your second section here, structural, I'm sorry, third section, structural adjustment. You wrote that today financial headlines are filled with stories about IMF visits to countries like Sri Lanka and Ghana. The outcome is that the fund, this is the, I think you're talking about the IMF fund here, right? Uh, Maybe it's the World Bank fund, I'm not sure. Loans billions of dollars to countries in crisis in exchange for what is known as structural adjustment. In a structural adjustment loan, borrowers not only have to pay back principal plus interest, They also have to agree to change their economies according to bank and fund demands. These requirements almost always stipulate that clients maximize exports at the expense of domestic consumption. During research for this essay, the author learned much from the work of the development of scholar Cheryl Payer, who wrote landmark books and papers on the influence of the bank and fund in the 1970s, 80s, and 90s. This author may disagree with payers' solutions, which, like those of most critics of the bank and fund, tend to be socialist, but many observations she makes about the global economy hold true regardless of ideology. And then she wrote, it is an explicit and basic aim of IMF programs to discourage local consumption in order to free resources for export. This point cannot be stressed enough. 
So the, again, monetary colonialism, right? The, using this financial system to extract actual resources from mm -hmm. countries, not only the resources that they produce at that point in time, but whatever resources you're effectively coercing them into producing for your own uh, import demands. And I mean, this is a weaponizing of the financial system, right? It, and it's market forces be damned. It's just whatever the, um, I guess. Well, let me give, let me give an example that animates or personifies the concept for the listener or the audience. Um, and it's, it's, um, something that happened countless times in the developing world, in the third world, uh, in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, et cetera, still happens today. Um, debt will be created, okay, um, and, and issued by the debt, by the bank, let's say, um, or by the fund and then, and then you know, used by uh, country X, used by the borrower to do this. But so you have money from the bank or the fund to pay for a resource extraction program in the mountains several hundred miles from the nearest coastline where they're mining let's say bauxite or something like that so the money is deployed to the to country x which has to now agree to basically like tighten its belt which basically means like you know uh, all of the uh, oligarchs who run the country continue to eat lobster and steak, but everybody else, you know, has to uh, suffer and, and, and experience a dramatic decline in standards of living so that they can take this money and build this, um, mining operation and then build a railroad to connect the mining operation to a, a port that they have to build. Now the port and the railroad and the mining operation, um, this is financed by the loan, but the companies who build these things are Western companies. Mm -hmm. So the money comes in and then it goes out, mm -hmm. right? So the the let's say the West Double has loan. already sort of, yeah, the West has already sort of made its money in a way, um, and now there exists this operation where bauxite is being like stripped out of the ground of this country uh, through a collaboration between foreign powers and the dictator. And it's being ferried off to international markets. The local people see none of this. They don't see any of this profit at all. Um, even the dictator himself tended to only see five to 10% of it. Mm -hmm. uh, if that, I mean, usually you had 90, 95, 98% of things like gold or bauxite uh, or pre OPEC, you know, oil, like, you know, accruing to the locals. Like it was, it was almost all profiting abroad. So you had, these foreign powers be able to with debt um basically like instantly well over a matter of years but like you know pop into existence a new resource farm for them for their economies where they were getting like super cheap uh whether it be electricity or, or gold or uranium or timber or whatever um and and who would actually have to pay for it the taxpayers of the country who lived under of the population who lived under the dictator. Hmm. So that, that's kind of what we're talking about here. Um, that is kind of the, that is what is known as development. Um, hmm. Hmm. Uh, and de again, development was the ability to turn debt into cheap resources and labor for rich countries at the expense of poor ones. Yeah. No, excellently said. Um, yeah, I guess for me, you've just done an excellent job detailing the cascade of consequences that result from the central planning of money, right? I, I, I can't mm -hmm. help but shake the view that the IMF and World Bank are just an extension of the central bank in, in many ways. I mean, obviously in a more colonial kind of predatory fashion, but they wouldn't mm -hmm. even be possible without the backstopping of central banking. And so, yeah, it's fundamentally the broken incentives well, they, of being able to I mean, I mean, the IMF money is technically, ad infinitum creates these institutions. I mean, the IMF is technically a central bank. I mean, it mints its own reserve currency, the SDR. Right. right. Now, it has to it has to be able to redeem those STRs, uh, uh, you know, right. in theory, for a certain number of dollars and euros or whatever. Yeah. But, I mean, who's counting? And uh, and they have hundreds of billions of these things, and they just decide to just make more of them. And it's not necessarily even clear if, like, they're made with an equal amount of deposits. It's, yeah. it's, it's, it's like, super unclear what's going on here. 
Um, I, I, uh, I think it's fair to call the IMF a supranational central bank. It yeah. is the global lender of last resort. There you go. Yeah. And that's why the central bank was, again, ostensibly established in the first place. But it's all like the core issue in my mind for this is the the detachment, right? It's lack of proof of work that you can just produce these new units of currency, mm -hmm. no work or no risk really, because you can always just issue more to, even if the, the borrower defaults, you just issue more currency and extend another loan. Exactly. And That's the, the moral hazard issue. Yeah. I mean, people are familiar with why this is a problem in a domestic economy. Like if you yeah, continue to bail out the banking industry, it's going to continue to be reckless. Well, right. what happens when you continue to bail out dictators around the world? Like right. they're going to continue yes, to be exactly. reckless. And, you know, look, it's fair to point out also that whenever a country would like try to oppose the IMF or reject the IMF or you know, oppose the World Bank, I mean, you know, they often faced like rough consequences. Like Indeed. sometimes these people were overthrown, assassinated. Yeah. Uh, this, this has happened a lot over, over the decades. And, you know, I don't, I don't know exactly in which circumstances there was like overt, you know, IMF involvement, but certainly, uh, or overt U S government involvement, but certainly there were in some cases and in other cases, it just, you know, life was made quite difficult for countries that tried to make an alternative model. Um, now today, what's interesting is you start to see, uh, there's a guy who writes for Credit Suisse, ironically, but uh, Zoltan Postar has been writing pretty prolifically on what he's calling Bretton Woods Three. Mm. So a post Bretton Woods Two era, Bretton Woods Two, uh, Bretton Woods One being the 44 to 71 financial system, and uh, where where the World Bank and IMF were created for a particular purpose, and relatively, as I've described kind of served for that purpose. And then Bretton Woods too, being like, let's say 1970, 69, 70, 71 to, to, to 2022, which, which he calls Bretton Woods too, which was the fiat standard, right? Where you really had the IMF and World Bank become these like beasts of, um, you know, crony capture and, mm -hmm. um, you know, backing dictators with paperwork and um, plunging countries into debt service uh and and just endless debt traps um and now he's pointing out that there's a Bretton Woods 3 which over time is going to I agree with him turn into a world where you know we don't have total dollar hegemony you you have a bunch of other countries that are using their own currencies there's a rise in gold like and you have basically a transformation mm. away from Bretton Woods 2 and you know I don't think he probably agrees with us on, on, on Bitcoin as like the next thing. Um, but that that's okay. Like he's done some good analysis and, and pointing out that we're, we're at a transition point here, um, mm -hmm. where it makes sense for a lot of countries to want to replicate what the U S has done and want to do it on their own terms. Like, like think about China, like that's what obviously trying China to do. would, yeah, they would prefer that Saudi Arabia, uh, accept, uh, yuan or RMB for oil. Mm -hmm. And then what does Saudi Arabia do with all that? Well, you know, you know, maybe they can, you know, buy software or AI or God knows what. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they, they want all these poor countries to accept, uh, RMB for, uh, goods for, for export, raw materials, exports. Um, and then they want the poor country. What, what do the poor countries do with all of the RMB that they get, uh, all the yuan they get, uh, payback debt <laughs> to China that right. they owe. Right. Right? right. So they're trying to like replicate what, what the IMF has been able to do for so many decades. So it's, it's, it's really interesting to watch, but um, I, I think you start seeing a uh, multipolar currency world. Uh, the in, in India is going to do a lot of the, I mean, a lot of stuff's mm -hmm. being denominated in Indian, in, in, in Indian rupees and also in Emirati dirhams. Like there's a lot going on there in the energy markets and financial markets. That's, that's, just changing. So, um, and look, I don't, the thing is like, if it weren't for Bitcoin, I would view this as a negative because like for all of the problems of the U S like, God, all these countries are just outright dictatorships. Right. Uh -huh. So, um, the idea that we might gravitate though, towards a currency that's not controlled by any one country and that is inherently pro freedom is, is extremely inspiring. So I think that's just kind of the table is set, let's say. And I Ex think that, extremely. that it, It'll, it, the table's set and we're headed probably in a direction where 
the 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 ruthless exploitation the ruthless but totally unknown exploitation of the IMF World Bank by the way like very few people understand this including me until recently um yeah obviously i well let's put it this way Lo- very few people in the west understand this i think that the mm-hmm. people of the global south are extremely aware of what the IMF World Bank do mm-hmm. um but let's say people in the west were very ignorant about this about their their own devices um but we need to educate ourselves about the matter as soon as possible so that we are uh, aware of what we've done i think that that's a kind of key first step forward um and you know we we could celebrate that maybe in this new monetary standard that 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 could be coming that that these these um you know ways to exploit and and rent seek off of populations far away are are going to be harder to do. I think that that's something that's worth uh, celebrating. Absolutely. Um, again, just kind of core to all of this, and in, in my view, is the sole purpose of fiat currency being wealth redistribution, right? It's always used to redistribute wealth, whether it's via inflation or these predatory lending practices. And so what do we need to fix that is we need redistribution proof money, which is Bitcoin, right? Mm -hmm. Something that's resistant to all that nonsense. And I think you've done a brilliant job outlining all of that. Again, the title of the piece is structural adjustment, how the IMF and world bank repress poor countries and funnel their resources to rich ones. Um, Alex, thank you for writing this. Thank you for joining me. Where can people find you online? Thanks so much. Um, you can find me on Twitter at Gladstein. You can also, uh, find my previous book, which explores some of these themes at cyfp.org. Check your financial privilege, cyp, cyfp.org. Um, <clears throat> you can find the article structural adjustment at Bitcoin magazine and, uh, hopefully by April or May, I will have uh, this out as a book called Hidden Repression. Um, and it'll be online and it'll also be in physical bookstores, which is pretty exciting. Um, thank you for having me, Robert. Uh, I know it's grim material, but uh, I think it's important for people to know our own history. Yes. Yes, it is very important. We need to understand the why, I think, if we're going to motivate people to understand Bitcoin. So, Alex, thanks so much. Thanks for having me. 